So hello fellow Hegelians. Today we want to talk again about Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy. And just to summarize briefly, briefly again what we have done. We've talked about the paradox of philosophy occurring in history. And with that regard, we then try to explain why this paradox comes to the fore. And it is because of the paradoxical structure of philosophy itself um, that makes its occurrence mostly, so far as we know, in human beings. And these human beings, unlike natural objects, have a mind. Now, many people doubt that we have a mind and they say, well, maybe we are just biologically determined. Okay, uh, we might be a biological machine, but see, there's always a phenomenon of self-reference. When we go to a restaurant, as Searle says, and the, wa the waiter asks us what we want to eat, we don't say, well, how do I know what my brain is going to order in five minutes? In fact, we make a self-description. We say, I want fish or whatever else you want. And we identify ourselves as a will, even though we may be a biological machine, nobody can deny that, uh, that he operates with this framework. So at least this framework exists. And in that sense, we make that a foundation for our daily life. And that is really what matters instead of adhering to a more abstract model where we say, well, you know, but actually I didn't order the fish. It was my, br come on, Occam's razor, cut. Okay, <laughs> so I'm not rejecting the biological perspective overall, but it makes sense to consider both possibilities and to think ourselves in terms of both possibilities, which I believe is a lesson that Hegel is going to teach us. Now, I start the lecture today here with this picture, Know Thyself. And that is really a question. Can we know ourselves? Especially when we look at our mind. And since the mind, according to a credo of Kant, can only know what it has produced on its own, it is likely that the mind is the first object that can be known. This is also why Descartes, while at the same time inventing things like the Cartesian coordinate system, which is overall related to the same thought. So this is why Descartes also focuses on the cogito, the I think, the thinking self, as a foundation for all our sciences. Hegel has some problems with Descartes that we are not going to discuss here. But I want to remind everyone that knowing thyself is not as easy as people usually believe. Usually believe. And I'm, I'm not just meaning rejecting the idea, yeah, I'm a biological mechanism. <laughs> no, I'm not just meaning that. I... I also want to say that if we go into Taoism, Taoism, or maybe even here with respect to Thales, Thales, I call him Thales, that knowing yourself is probably the most difficult thing to achieve. And also in Hegel's endeavor, it is not easy. In Taoism, philosophers usually say that the plant just lives in itself. The animal maybe lives already in a way for itself, but it still completely lives from its center back to its center, as Helmut Plesner would say. So it remains its nature. But human's nature is to not, having, is to not have a nature which is a paradox. 
its nature is not having a nature, but that is its nature. And this is what I claim makes the whole endeavor so complicated. Now, this is not about a meme or the question of the matrix, so that you saw the problem overall. It is a question that exists for Hegel. We come back to this meme in a short while. So therefore, let's now look at the text. We go back to the paradox, the development in time of the various philosophies that Hegel discusses. And the first question which may be asked in reference to this history concerns that distinction in regard to the manifestations of the idea which has just been noticed. It is the question as to how it happens that philosophy appears to be a development in time and has a history. Back to the original problem and you don't get $4,000. The answer to this question encroaches on the metaphysics of time, and it would be a digression from our object to give here more than the elements on which the answer rests. So we have to understand what is time. And by the way, I just say that time is not equal history for Hegel. Time is a form of intuition, which actually was an idea that Kant introduced. And it means that it is a way of how we order the different sensations that hid us from the probably mind external world. Um, and in that sense, time is not necessarily something that has the objective reality that we at the same time perceive in our mind. And Hegel is aware about that. So there, there is no flat out definition of what time is absolutely. It has been shown above in reference to the existence of mind that its being is its activity. Now, what does that mean that the being of a mind is activity? Nature, on the contrary, as it is, it changes others' only repetition and its movements take the form of a circle merely. So we have here the opposite. Nature, he wants to define what the mind actually does. Nature is just something that happens, that occurs, that occurs again and again. To express this better, the activity of the mind is to know itself. So that's what the mind attempts to do, to know itself in a sense it also knows itself and thus it produces knowledge. But now of course the question is, well, how does it know itself? I am immediately, but this I am, I am only as a living organism. So yeah, like this is the idea of Descartes. We are an I that is immediately aware of itself, but we know, and now the biological perspective comes in, that we only exist through our body. If we sleep, our body shuts down the lights. We don't perceive ourselves. Same before our birth. We didn't have really access to ourselves. So Hegel is not rejecting the biological perspective that Descartes, who was maybe arguing for an internal soul, has maybe neglected. So as mind, I'm only in so far as I know myself. So somehow that must include the biological perspective, though reducing it to the biological perspective would probably also constitute a mistake. Know thyself, the inscription over the temple of the oracle at Delphi is the absolute command which is expressed by mind in its ex essential character. But consciousness really implies that for myself, I am object to myself. So we don't need like necessarily the inscription over the oracle of Delphi because consciousness, the way it is structured, implies that it has to know itself. Because we are an object for ourselves, for example, as biological organisms. In forming this absolute division between what is mine and myself, my body, and I who possesses the body, I mean, honestly, when you say, this is my body, right? Who says that is mine? 
who is I if not the body? So if we completely attach to a biological perspective, I think it gets more complicated to define the rights of self-determination. Maybe possible, just say, becomes probably more complicated. Informing this absolute, okay, we had that, okay. Mind constitutes its existence and establishes itself as external to itself. From the internal, sees itself as the external. It postulates itself in the externality, which is just the universal and the distinctive form of existence in nature. So it sees itself as externality. Externality is here produced internally. So what is external and what is seen as nature is a result of the activity of the mind. That is what he says here. And that's why we can also call Hegel an idealist. It doesn't mean that everything that exists is only the mind. It just means that the activity of the mind is involved in the process of knowing. But one of the forms of externality is time. So time is a form. okay, And this form requires to be further examined both in the philosophy of nature and the finite mind. So we have to ask now, what is this form of time, which is a form of externality? And as we can see, it's a result of the activity of the mind, of the original distinction between me and myself as an external object in nature, as the body that I own, my body. This being an existence and therefore being in time is a moment not only of the individual consciousness, which as such is essentially finite, but also of the development of the philosophical idea in the element of thought. Okay, this is a sentence I have some trouble with again. But the idea is uh, we, we, this being in existence. So we are in existence outside of ourselves. And therefore we are selves in time. Is a moment that is not only a moment of myself as an individual consciousness. Okay, now I can probably follow. But it is also a moment in the development of the philosophical idea in the element of thought. Yeah, so it, like this moment um, of externalization is also part of the absolute idea that we have discussed before. And what is the absolute idea? It is the conglomeration, and maybe not just the conglomeration, it's the systematic whole of all thoughts or determined thoughts that can be thought. For the idea thought of as being at rest is indeed not in time. Okay, if we now take the idea and we say that it's just a resting whole, never moves, then it is not in time. To think of it as at rest and preserve it in the form of immediacy is, equivalently, is equivalent to its inward perception. So, yeah, when we think the idea from an internal perspective, we have all the thoughts and they are not moving, okay? And that would be an inward and internal perspective. But the idea is concrete, is, as has been shown, the unity of differences. So this is what we have said, that the idea as a whole would be unmoving, not potential, and then man would just know himself. But knowing is an activity, and if it weren't an activity of man, then it would be just a state. So, but then in, in that state, there would be no development of that idea. So it's co contradicting our experience of how we get to knowledge and how we preserve knowledge. So therefore, we have shown that the idea is concrete, and that means that it tries to unify um, the fact that it is potentially 
potential and in this case it means that humans know the whole only potentially. It is not really at rest, rest and its existence is not really sense perception but as differentiation within itself and therefore as development it comes into existent being and into externality in the element of thought. And thus pure philosophy appears in thought as a progressive existence in time. So this is an attempt to solve the paradox, if you can see it too. It, it says like, yeah, of course, philosophy is potentially known completely to us, but because an essential part of it is to develop in human beings as reason, since it is an activity, it occurs to us as progress. It appears to us as progress and it has to appear in this way. But this element of thought is itself abstract and is the activity of a single consciousness. Okay, now we have an abstract thought uh, of the concrete idea. That is what he's saying. Okay, it's still external to us. Mind is, however, not only to be considered as individual finite consciousness, but as that mind which is universal and concrete within itself. Okay, so we have a mind that just you possess, or maybe that just I possess, that is individual. But then we also say that there is a more universal mind, similar to the idea that Aristotle had of the godlike mind, uh, that is in all human beings potentially. And in a sense, there's something that speaks for it, namely that we can share in the same ideas, which are mind objects, and we can hold the same mind objects at the same time, which would imply that there are either two objects, one in your mind, one in mine, or that we hold the same object, but then it's maybe like then it would be two objects, which are the same. That's also weird. So in that sense, we could also say maybe it's just one mind that we have. So we run here into further paradoxes. That's the important aspect. Mind is... Yeah, okay, we had that, but as the mind which is universal and concrete within itself. This concrete universality, however, comprehends all the various sides and modes evolved in which it is and becomes object to the idea. So the absolute idea is the totality and the whole of all thoughts, and this is also what the universal mind has. Uh, thus, mind's thinking mind's thinking comprehension of self is at the same time the progression of the total actuality evolved. Oh, Hegel. This gets complicated. Oh. So there's a universal that is outside that... Man, I have to read that again. That, that is a complicated passage. So if you could let me know in the comments what this passage means, I would be very thankful because I feel like I don't, I don't capture it completely. Let me read it again. Mind is, however, not only to be considered as individual finite consciousness, but as that mind which is universal and concrete within itself. Okay, this is clear. This concrete universality, however, comprehends all the various sites and models evolved in which it is and becomes object to the idea. I don't understand the last part how it becomes object to the idea, but the universal mind has the whole history of its development included, right? Because development is part of what it is. And if we really capture what it is, if we really know ourselves, then we also know all the various stages. And so this self-knowledge must then be included in the absolute idea, I guess. Thus, mind's thinking comprehension of self is at the same time the progression of the total actuality evolved. Okay, so I think what that means, and I may be wrong, it means that the progression that the mind does in discovering itself must be part of the idea itself, like the knowledge of the different stages. This progression is not one which takes its course through the thought of an individual and exhibits itself in a single consciousness, for it sh shows itself to be universal mind presenting itself in the history of the world in all the richness of its forms. 
So this, this development of this universal mind is then not just limited to one single consciousness, but can be distributed to many minds that ultimately work together and share their ideas. So here we have a distributed history of uh, the universal mind where individual minds work together on their, on their same universal mind. So we, we kind of have two minds, as I understand it, an individual mind and a universal mind. This, uh, yeah, okay, we had that. So the result of this development is that one form, one stage in the idea comes to consciousness in one particular race, okay, like the Germans or the Greeks, so, or the Chinese, okay, uh, not wanting to make this too racist and too Eurocentric, uh, so that this race and this time expresses only this particular form. within which it constructs its universe and works out its conditions. So here we have the real historical Hegel, how the universal mind makes an appearance in these different historical modes without ever completely grasping itself as the entire universal independent from its historical conditions. The higher stage, on the other hand, centuries later reveals itself in another race of people. Now, if we thus grasp the principles of the concrete and of development, the nature of the manifold obtains quite another signification. And what is said of the diversity in philosophies, as if the manifold were fixed and stationary and composed of what is mutually exclusive, is at once refuted and relegated to its proper place. So we have now beaten like many of the uh, complaints about philosophy, for example, that it's self-contradictory or that philosophers contradict each other because contradiction and the, the composition of differences is part of what the mind and what philosophy is. Such talk is that in which those who despise philosophy think they possess an invincible weapon against it, and in their truly beggarly pride and their pitiful representations of it, they are in perfect ignorance, even of what they have and what they have to know in any meager ideas attained such as in that of the manifold and diverse. So these people who think that they have like these invincible weapons, um, they actually show a pride that is not justified. Okay, uh, and, and that is because they are still ignorant about the fact that the manifold and the diverse is part of philosophy. Yet this category is one which anybody can understand. No difficulty is made in regard to it, for it is thoroughly known, and those who use it think they can do so as being entirely comprehensible. As a matter, of course, they understand what it is. I don't understand this one, but I, I, I have the feeling that this sentence is not so important. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> Usually I make the experience if you skip a sentence, it will revenge itself already in the next sentence. Okay, but those who believe the principle of diversity to be one absolutely fixed do not know its nature or its dialectic. The manifold or diverse is in a state of flux it must really be conceived of as in the process of development and as but a passing moment. Philosophy in its concrete idea is the activity of development in revealing the differences which it contains within itself. These differences are thoughts, for we are now speaking of development in thought. So yeah, again, the same argument, there is no fixed diversity, it's also flowing, and this is like his idea of history that I want to propagate. In the first place, the differences which rest in the idea are manifested as thoughts. Okay, the differences of the idea come to us in the form of thoughts. Secondly, these distinctions must come into existence, one here and the other there. 
Okay, so the distinctions that are in the idea, they come up here or there, different moments in time. And in order that they may do this, they must be complete. That is, they must contain within themselves the idea in its totality. So as the diversity comes up, it also is a part of the activity of developing these ideas and it's part of the potentially wholeness of that development. And so in that sense, they are all participating in the idea. So the real, very platonic, is participating in what is the idea, while the idea, of course, is at the same time in what is the concrete here, right? It's not that we have a second realm necessarily, okay? It's a, it's, it's a kind of production where we reproduce what is at work in the real world. The concrete alone, as including and supporting these distinctions, is the actual. So this is what he says, right? So when we look at our experiences and at nature, that is what really is the idea. It is thus and thus alone that the differences are in the form entire. Okay, now, did we say that this is mine external reality? No, we didn't say that. We just say this is like the process of experience that we investigate so far, which includes human beings who take themselves as minds and in this participate in an activity of discovering themselves as much as in themselves as also as their bodies included in a world, world history. A complete form of thought such as is here presented is a philosophy. So yeah, a complete form of thought. So a form of thought is also a particular time. That's what we have said before. And this can be a historical moment and a completeness of these thoughts of one movement, of one circle, is a philosophy. But the idea contains the distinctions in a peculiar form. It may be said that the form is indifferent and that the content, the idea, is the main consideration. So this may be said, that's not what he says, right? So we have form, the way how philosophy or the idea appears, and then but the idea is the real content that has no form. Does he say that? Does he really say that? Um, the idea, so, and people think themselves quite moderate and reasonable when they state that the different philosophies all contain the idea, though in different forms. Understanding by this that these forms are contingent. But everything hangs on this. These forms are nothing else than the original distinctions in the idea itself, which is what it is only in them. So it's not a distinction of form and content. The forms we see are the content. They really are the idea. They are in this way essential to and constitute the content of the idea, which in thus sundering itself attains to form. The manifold character of the principles which appear is, however, not accidental, but necessary. The different forms constitute an integral part of the whole form. So it's necessary that we find different forms. They are what the idea really is. They are not just like emanations of a thing in itself behind, okay? We have the thing in itself in our mind, which to, to my mind means that we can know ourselves. The manifold character, I read this right, there are the determinations of the original idea which together constitute the whole, but as being outside of one another, their union does not take place in them, but in us, the observers. Each system is determined as one, but it is not a permanent condition that the differences are thus mutually exclusive. The inevitable fate, the inevitable fate of these determinations must follow, and that is that they shall be drawn together and reduced to elements or moments. The independent attitude taken up by each moment is again laid at side. After expansion, contra contraction follows the unity out of which the first emerged. So we have here a return to the idea of activity, of progressing in time, uh, the principle of development that Hegel has expressed before. This third may itself be but the beginning of a farther development. It may seem as if this progression were to go to an, into infinitude, 
but it has an absolute end in view, which we shall know be better later on. Many turnings are necessary, however, before, before mind frees itself in coming to consciousness. Okay, we have like uh, two, uh, two text passages left, but I really want to stop here where Hegel says that, it, that the development is not a development of infinitude, but that it moves towards an end. And here we have another interpretation of Hegel where we often say, well, you know, he has actually a teleology. And I don't want to reject that entirely, but what is the teleological goal? Is it a stable resting entity? like a future society where all humans are free and history has come to itself and therefore history finds its end? That would be communism? Well, Hegel says that history as a progression has an end, a goal. But this is the activity of mind recognizing itself to posit itself as absolute, which in Hegel's mind means to be independent, and that is a certain idea of freedom, which is achieved in diverse forms. As Hegel would say, so far he can see a development towards greater freedom. We could debate that, but I believe that the end he has in mind is freedom. And see, if we say freedom, it cannot be A stable resting form. Freedom is always expanding beyond itself. It is also a contradiction and certainly another big topic of philosophy which I cannot completely take apart for you now. But question to you, if you read Hegel, what do you think is this freedom? So thanks for listening. Read more Hegel, live long so that you can do that and so that you will finally prosper.